Great, and hello, welcome everybody. Um, we are so excited to have you joining us today for the kickoff of Face to Face 2022, our virtual keynote address, looking back to move forward, the arts at a crossroads. My name is Kimberly Olson, and I'm the executive director of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a pale-skinned white woman with ever-growing long brown hair. I'm wearing a vibrant yellow dress with flowers on it. Uh, and I'm sitting right now against a white wall with a piece of wooden art behind me. Uh, for those of you that might be new to the round table, we are a grassroots service organization working to improve and advance the field of arts education through professional development, advocacy, online resource sharing, and re-granting as well. And although we are currently meeting via an online platform, the roundtable would like to acknowledge that we work and live on unceded lands. Manhattan, or the place that is widely known as New York City, exists on the contemporary and ancestral homelands of the Canarsie, Lenape, Muncie, and Wappinger people. These sovereign nations and communities are still thriving here and we continue to occupy their lands. We'd like to give a moment of respect to them as well as to the black and immigrant communities which have helped build the city we know today. As we recognize that all of our pasts, presents and futures are intertwined, we would also like to lift up contemporary indigenous arts organizations that we can all support and learn from. Thank you. Um, and we're going to paste in the chat a few organizations that the Roundtable has a relationship with, uh, the Lenape Center, Red Hawk Native American Arts Council, as well as American Indian Community House, the latter of which will actually be uh, participating to some degree in face-to-face -face later on this month. So we encourage you to learn more about these organizations and support them with donations if possible. We also encourage you to share any resources or organizations in the chat that you might wanna highlight. Uh, so please feel free to paste those now. We are always looking for more organizations to uplift in this work. Uh, as a reminder, if you're having trouble with Zoom, please send myself or Kinsey Keck uh, a private message. We're happy to support. We encourage you to use the chat to connect with other people. Please drop a, a hello in the chat already. Let us know who you are, where you're zooming in from. Uh, we're so glad to be joined by people from across New York City, but we also know from across the country as well, working in all arts disciplines. So please say hello there. Uh, a note that this call does include closed captioning. To activate this setting, please click the live transcript button on your screen and then select show subtitles. Um, as you can see, this call also has live ASL interpretation as well. Uh, this event also is being recorded and will be made available on the Roundtable's website and YouTube page. Uh, I should say also our sponsors are just pivotal in bringing the annual face-to-face -face conference to life. We are so grateful for their support of face-to-face -face 2022 and of arts education in New York City. Oh, wonderful. Thanks so much, Kinsey, is sharing. Um, just to name them out loud as well, the Roundtable is deeply grateful to Disney, M&T Bank, uh, Leap NYC, the College of New York's, uh, City College of New York's Graduate Program in Educational Theater, the Center for Fiction, Dance NYC, the Arthur Miller Foundation, and Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. We could not put this conference on without the, their sponsorship, so thank you so much. Additionally, Face to Face is made possible by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Governor's Office and the New York State Legislature, and also by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. And with that, we are thrilled to be gathering with you all virtually and in person for this year's Face to Face. A shout out to all of the educators, administrators, artists, cultural workers who have been working tirelessly over the past two years to make sure that arts education continues at a time when it's needed most. To those who've been working tirelessly as well to ensure a more equitable, inclusive, and just cultural ecosystem. We believe you are superheroes and the round table is honored to act in service to you and our field at large. Um, speaking of our field, there are many members of our field that helped put this conference up on its feet. Please show our conference committee some love. Their names are gonna be pasted in the chat. Um, a special thank you as well to our conference co-chairs, Shoba Kevin Akudiel, Amy Harris, 
Dr. Darrell Cooper and Alexandra Lopez. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to one of those fabulous people, uh, Dr. Darrell Cooper, founder and CEO of Cultural Innovations Group. Welcome, Darrell. Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, that's amazing. Um, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, we as artists, arts educators, cultural workers, and arts administrators are central to the world's recovery. Art and culture often outlasts the people and societies who created it. With that, I wanna mention the tireless work of roundtable staff, board, and the face-to-face -face, uh, planning committee that Kimberly mentioned on the 2022 conference. This year, as the committee, we were thinking deeply and intentionally about community. What does it mean to come together? How can we come together to move the field forward for young people, for our future, for their enrichment and ours? This is the first time in the Roundtable's history that we are doing a hybrid conference. We have both virtual and in-person offerings. Uh, the first will be tomorrow in Queens at Queens Museum. And uh, the second will be in Brooklyn at Mark Morris on April 21st. Uh, again, I wanna thank all of you for your support of the Roundtable. And I really wanna say that today is a celebration. You know, face-to-face -face 2022, we've made it. But now let's see how far we can go together. With that, I would like to bring in the incredible Mahogany L. Brown. Mahogany L. Brown, selected as Kennedy Center's Next 50, is the executive director of Just Media, a media literacy initiative with a focus on the criminal legal system, and is informed by her career as a writer, organizer, and educator. Brown has received fellowships from Art for Justice Fund, Air Serenby, Cave Kanim, Poets House, Mellon Research in Rauschenberg. She is the author of recent works, Vinyl Moon, Chlorine Sky, Woke, A Young Poet's Call to Justice, Woke Baby, Black Girl Magic, and book-length poem, I Remember Death by Its Proximity to What I Love. She is the founder of Woke Baby Book Fair, a traveling diverse reading campaign, and is the first ever poet in residence at the Lincoln Center and lives currently in Brooklyn, New York. Welcome, Mahogany. Thank you so much. My name is Mahogany L. Brown. I'm wearing a red uh, zip up hoodie in front of a wall of vinyl. And I'll be sharing two poems with you today. First, this is the honey. There is no room on this planet for anything less than a miracle. We gather here today to revel in the rebellion of a silent tongue. Every day, we lean forward into the light of our brightest designs and cherish the sun. Praise our hands and throats, each incantation, a jubilee of a people dreaming wildly. Despite the dirt beneath our feet or the wind pushing against our greatest efforts, soil creates things. Art births change. This is the honey. And doesn't it taste like a promise? Where your heart is an accordion and our laughter is a soundtrack. Friend, dance to this good song. Look how it holds our names. Each bone of our flesh homes sing welcome. Oh, look at the gods dancing as the rain rains against a steely skyline where grandparents sit on the porch and nod at the spectacle in awe of the perfection of their grandchildren's faces. Each small discovery unearthed in its own outpour. Tomorrow, our daughters will travel the world with each poem and our sons will design cities against the backdrops of living museums. Yes, our children will spin chalk until each equation bursts a familial tree rooted in miraculous possibilities and alive. Thank you. 
the final poem I'd like to share is asking you to just prepare yourself for a meditation. So wherever you are, uh, if you can place both feet on the ground, heels touching, um, open your hands, palm side up, lay them on your lap, close your eyes, deep breath in through your nose, hold your breath. And I need you to think of how you prepare to leave your house each day. Exhale through your mouth and how you prepare to return home safely. This poem is a meditation considering how we return home safely. Before COVID was a thing, there were always these, uh, this armor that we put on. Um, so this is for you. Uh, this is for your journey. And thank you again for having me. Today you will, and today you choose. Today is yours. Yes, today is only today. Tomorrow ain't here yet, so slow down. Slow down. Breathe softly. Breathe slowly. Breathe for the homies that ain't here. Breathe for the homies that is. Breathe for your own good skin, your skin, your smile, your you, you, you. Come back. Come back. Come back to yourself. Look at your cheekbones. Look at the loft of your eyebrows, you so worthy. You so heavy in your weight of yes. You so necessary. You so fly. You wet the water. You cool the brow. You heat the skillet. You the sunset and the sustenance. You keep them chasing the sparks you leave. Today, you will. And today you choose. And today is yours. Yesterday is only today. Because tomorrow ain't here yet. So slow down, slow down, breathe softly, slowly, breathe for the homies that ain't here, breathe. For the kin that is, breathe for your own good skin, your skin, your smile, your you, 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 come back, come back, come back to yourself. Miraculous stargaze, most fortunate sky beam, beyond brilliant, be your resilience, but you knew that already, who told you any different, you tell them. Today you will, and today you choose, and today is yours. Yes, today is only today, because tomorrow ain't here yet, so slow down, slow down. Breathe softly, slowly. Breathe for the homies that ain't here. Breathe for the kin that is. Breathe for your own good skin, your skin, your smile, your tribe, your you, you, you. Come back, come back, come back to yourself. Anything that don't heighten your stride, leave it today. Anything that don't propel your wingspan forward, leave it today. Whoever told you you wasn't strong, whoever told you you wasn't fly, whoever told you you wasn't brilliant, whoever told you you wasn't beautiful is a lie. Deep breath in through your nose. Exhale doubt. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Whew. I say we have a conference. Thank you so much for that, Mahogany. Uh, now it is my honor to introduce the one and only Dr. Indira Etwaru. Dr. Indira has worked with cultural institutions across the country and the world to launch multi-platform content strategies that represent the exquisite diversity of the globe and to explore the complex intersections between stories that matter and the topics of our time, leading towards models of institutional equity, 
and thriveability in the 21st century. Dr. Atwaru was a major force for innovation and inclusion in the public radio field as the founding executive producer of the multi-platform, state-of-the-art Jerome L. Green performance space at the New York Public Radio and founding executive producer and director of NPR Presents to develop a national live events platform to bring on-air and online content to audiences across the world. She led Restoration Art and the Billie Holiday Theater through radical growth, including the launch of the first national strategic plan for thrivability for black theater institutions, the Black Seed. Indira's first foray in the nonprofit arts and cultural world began at BAM. Dr. Etwaru has developed and is teaching the course Leading Performing Arts Institutions in the 21st Century at New York University. She has received many awards and honors for her work, including being named one of the 40 under 40 national leaders by the Net Network Journal. She has lectured and published extensively on the arts, race and equity, and has served as a Fulbright Scholar where she lived and worked in Ethiopia. She is currently working for Apple, and she is also a director and choreographer. Please welcome Dr. Indira. Good afternoon, everyone. I, am, uh, I offer my profound gratitude to Kimberly Olson, Dr. Darrell Cooper, and the leadership and educators within the Arts and Education Roundtable's face-to-face -face conference. Thank you for having me join you today. Um, thank you also, Mahogany Brown, for standing in the authority of your beautiful poetic humanity. I am just simply honored to be with all of you this afternoon. I was born to a time of fire. These are the words written by 20th century Pulitzer Prize winning writer August Wilson, words spoken by his character boy Willie in the piano lesson. I was born to a time of fire, born in Southeast Washington, DC, center stage of the racial unrest of the 1970s, a time of storefronts burning, protest, and a people, my people, pushing back against the systematic racism that has plagued this country from 1619, when a narrative of freedom commenced as captive Africans jumped overboard to escape the cruel novelty of bondage as the white lion, the first of many vessels, roared to the shores of Jamestown settlement, miles from where I grew up in Newport News, Virginia. This narrative of freedom continued with every runaway slave, every enslaved child who secretly learned to read and write by the dim light of a candle and every passenger on an underground railroad. This narrative of freedom strained under a proclamation that emerged out of one of the bloodiest battles on American soil some 150 years ago, and it grew faint as the laws of Jim Crow produced a strange fruit that filled the air with an aroma not soon to be forgotten. This narrative sparked a renaissance in Harlem after birthing the blues, an art form reinvented time and time again as a visceral resistance to terror in one's own country. This narrative marched on Washington even as warriors of justice would never see the narrative of history rewritten. This narrative of freedom has many authors. It is a living document that has been edited, amended, and revised time and time again. It has been tested, challenged, downtrodden, and it has been shored up with countless whispered prayers and hallelujah shouts. This narrative sustained itself from the shores and soils of Africa and became a conduit, bringing the pulse, the rhythm, the culture, of different tribes to a new world. Today's organizers asked me to talk about my journey, to share my life's work with you. So I approach today's talk from a place of narrative, sharing personal and professional anecdotes. I include conversations 
with two amazing leaders I've worked with during my professional journey and who have shaped my approach to the field of arts and culture, Karen Brooks Hopkins and Laura Walker. And then I end with some thoughts on the future. Yes, I was born to a time of fire, a first generation born American to an immigrant father born and raised in Port Moran, Guyana, the first of six brothers to venture beyond the land of many waters in South America to Washington DC to attend Howard University. The nation's capital is where he met my mother, an African-American pianist and steel drum player. At the time, the only woman who played with Howard Steel Drum Band, who born and raised in Washington DC also worked as an executive assistant with the government, something many aspire to because it was good work, which meant consistent hours and benefits, not necessarily a fair wage or even quality working conditions. I was born to a time of fire and I was born to these two beautiful people who centered their children and who instilled in us values of honoring the humanity of all people, regardless of race, nationality, gender, sexual orientation, or faith, a value of the arts and creative expression, a core of democratic ideals, and a value to believe in something bigger than ourselves, a supreme force in the world, a faith that could move mountains. I was born to a time of fire and life was not easy for two people of color raising five children in the nation's capital. My father often worked two or three jobs and my mother was ill with cancer, a fact she hid from us until my freshman year in college. We were often on public assistance to make ends meet as a family, but there was music in our home. There was dancing, there was laughter, and there was my father's amazing curry chicken and roti. I had no idea that we lived in what would have been classified as living in poverty. When I was accepted into college, it was a moment of great pride for my family. I remember my father on a call with the financial aid officer of the college as my family prepared for the first time to hand one of their children over to an educational institution to live away from home, away from my brothers and sisters, to study there and to spend four years with the promise of something better when I finished. I sat next to my father while he was on the phone call and he kept repeating himself. I witnessed this growing frustration, but. My father kept calm about it and he slowly continued to repeat himself. Finally, he sat down in the chair. The air seemed to leave his body, going from the squared off shoulders that I saw at the top of the call to rounded shoulders that slumped forward. He handed me the phone. I took it and said, hello, this is Indira Etuaro. A high, thin voice responded. Thank God, I couldn't understand a word he was saying. My father looked at me with eyes that pleaded for me to not get angry, which was my normal response to any injustice or ignorance at that age in my life. Had it not been for my father's eyes, eyes that had a deeper understanding and tolerance that our country, our world, that woman, were still evolving in their humanity. So I got through that call with the semblance of civility, my financial aid and order, and thus began my formal post-secondary education. My mom and dad always had enough space for one more person, enough inner understanding to tolerate the oppression and ignorance of an ever evolving America and enough love to let me find myself in what often feels like a lost world. They're no longer with me, with us, but these values live on in me and my four brothers and sisters. I was born to a time of fire, a time of desegregation, a time of busing children beyond the boundaries of their own neighborhoods, 
I was part of the great American experiment of racial integration, desegregation busing that transported me and my brothers and sisters outside of our neighborhoods and to uptown schools as a means of ending racial injustice and inequity. But we woke hours earlier than our white counterparts. We stood on dark, often dangerous street corners, waiting for the daylight and a yellow school bus to come and to usher us into a more just world. My mom caught several city buses to get to school activities or PTA meetings, sometimes arriving a few minutes late, only to be met by administrators and teachers, almost all white, who were less than hospitable, often scolding. I oscillated between feelings of embarrassment and rage that my mom was being treated this way, feelings that a seven or eight year old does not quite know how to articulate. It was two worlds coming together and figuring out how to coexist with civility, with humanity. And it was clear that although we were registered to attend that school, we did not yet belong. I was born to a time of fire, a time of a little black girl sitting in a talented and gifted class of all white children and white teachers. Surely I wasn't the only child that was young, gifted and black. A little black girl who ran faster than anyone else in the third grade, even the boys. And when I ran, I felt free as the wind. Until one day, the teacher, the PE teacher, told me to take a step back from the starting line. She blew her whistle, we ran, and I won. She had me take another step back, and she blew her whistle, and I ran, and I won. She started to have me take three or four steps back. She would blow her whistle, and I started to lose. Doubt began to creep in that perhaps I was not as fast as I thought, certainly not as free. My third grade teacher walked up to that PE teacher. She stood in her face and she said, don't you ever do that again. You start Indira at the same line as everyone else. Her name was Miss DeWitt and she had the same haircut as the ice skater Dorothy Hamill. I didn't have a language for it then. My mother often used the term angels, but this was an early example of allyship. A person who recognizes their own privilege and uses it to influence inclusion and call out or challenge behaviors perpetuating systematic oppression based on race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, ability, or whatever it needs to be. I viscerally was learning what it means to not live in a world of privileges, of running a race where the system had me starting at a point behind everyone else. Another story I thought about was the first day of middle school and we were placed in a line for day one of our electives. Mine was banned. I would like to play the violin, please, I said to the woman handing out instruments. I'm sorry, we're out of violins. Do you like the clarinet? No, I responded. The trumpet? No, I responded. Oh, how about the flute? Okay, yes, okay, I'll take the flute. I was handed an old, dull and dented flute on day one of sixth grade because they ran out of violins. But I love that old nickel flute. It was an Armstrong flute. As the middle child of five, it was all mine. Not something to share or split up into five equal pieces, but mine. Growing up listening to my mother play the piano in our home, a woman who memorized Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue in her high school years, music came easily to all of us. I went on to sit first chair from middle school, first chair in high school through college where I earned the prestigious whole music scholarship in order to attend college. 
a scholarship that was decided based on a blind audition from a submitted cassette tape. Yes, a cassette tape that dates me a bit, meaning they never saw me. They made a decision on solely hearing me perform. It amazes me now as I think back on this, how being invisible often oscillates between being both a benefit and a detriment in my personal journey as a Black woman. I'm often asked by younger artists as to whether or not they should attend graduate school. Zora Neale Hurston, the great American writer, said that there are years that ask questions and years that answer them. I often answer that graduate school was about cultivating years to ask questions for me questions about everything, turning over every stone in my head, in my heart, in my life. I studied with women and men who changed the trajectory of my life during these years, Sonia Sanchez, Ernie McClintock, Carrie Amu Welsh, and so many others, people who were extraordinary pioneers in their fields and who were waiting to pass the baton of revolution on to a next generation. These were the artists who, who helped shape an entire generation of Black artists and Black-led institutions. They too were born to a time of fire. Even as I studied with some of the leading experts in their fields, my entire outlook on life, the core of my being, it was shaken and I was changed by 12 women. 12 refugee Somali women whom I lived amongst for one year. These women had fled from Mogadishu, Somali during the 1991 conflict. They survived civil conflict, rape, children being killed by soldiers and lions, days, weeks, and months of walking to flee to another country with only their babies on their backs and their children in tow. But they became cultural conduits bringing with them their songs, their dances, music, poetry, and history. They were the carriers of culture and the living bodies of knowledge. When I first arrived, I ventured out on a Saturday in January of 2004. The sun blazed, dust rose, reached my eyes, and caused me to squint as a small pool, small puddles of sweat began to form beneath my hijab which I was given as a gift by one of the women. Fastened to my back in an oversized scarf, my infant five-month-old daughter ducked her head into the nook of my arm to ward off the, the glare of the sun. She was peeking out every so often to satisfy a very, very curious gaze. She took in the dirt roads, packed with people negotiating over prices in Amharic, Oramifa, Somali, Arabic, and several other languages. Chickens scampered from the frenzied footsteps of mules and goats and sheep. Women stood in clusters, arms akimbo, dressed in these vibrant colors and patterns. And children sang in high-pitched falsetto tones for any spare change, while vendors took up every imaginable space, crammed together to sell their wares. I was in the heart of Ethiopia's Mercato for the first time, overwhelmed yet grateful that Kadan, a Somali woman whom I met upon my arrival to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, was with me. Somehow, even with the language barrier between us, we quickly became friends. Hustling to keep up with her easy stride that was like swirling water in a sea of people, my daughter's backside created an indent and my left hip, we weaved in and out of narrow shifting mazes of people. And I tried my best not to show my anxiousness, foreignness, lack of orientation. And on this hot, hot day with dust rising everywhere, my incredible thirst. Frantically trying to balance my bag, my hijab and my daughter, Kadan, and one seamless motion tightened her red scarf around her face, placed my bag across her shoulder, took my hand in hers, and I swear that moment was like a cool 
drink of water. And yet another example of a woman using her place in a world to create safety and space for me. When I came back to the US, I returned a drastically different human being. This was the professional beginning of my journey to explore and create meaning around the complex intersections between communities, the arts, and the challenges of our time. Thus began my interest in working in the nonprofit sector. As I stood at a precipice to move into this new world with an extremely heightened sense of injustice and inequity, I did so without fully understanding the paradoxes I would find, a tale of two cities that exist in the world of arts and culture. My first foray began at BAM in the Education and Humanities Program, where I led Dance Africa projects and partnerships, our dance and Shakespeare residency programs, as well as developed and managed new theater and visual arts programming that allowed BAM to work with youth courts, which refer to courts that involve young people in the sentencing of their peers who are diverted from juvenile courts. I also developed and led professional development programs for New York City educators. There I met and worked with Karen Brooks Hopkins. Karen Brooks Hopkins was BAM's president where she worked since 1979. From 1999 until her retirement in June 2015. In 2004, Karen concluded a two-year term as the chair of the Cultural Institutions Group, which comprises 33 prominent New York City cultural institutions. In this capacity, she also served as a member of the Mayor's Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission and is currently a member of the boards of New York City and Company the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership and the Global Cultural Districts Network. In 2007, she was named one of the 100 most influential women in New York City business by Cranes. In 2012, Hopkins was awarded an honorary doctorate of Humane Letters from St. Francis College in Brooklyn. She was designated a woman of achievement by the Professional Association Women in Development in 2013 and named one of 50's most powerful women in New York City by Cranes. She has been touring the country to share her recently published book, BAM, and then it hit me, an inspiring memoir for 36 years. Please welcome Karen Brooks Hopkins. Hello everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Hello Indira. And hello to everyone in the group who is gathered today for this interesting discussion. Oh, thank you so much, Karen, for being with me, with us this afternoon. So much to talk about, always so little time. First, congratulations yeah. on your new book and your amazing work. Um, as the longest tenured leader, I believe, of America's oldest performing arts center, BAM, <laughs> There is so much we can look to as a model for the field in the areas of innovation, urban revitalization, and more that you guided the architecture for. You and I have shared many conversations around social justice and equity. I specifically rem remember one morning when I was at BAM, Karen, and the Education and Humanities office was adjacent to your office. And you came racing in and you slapped this uh, draft of a brochure on my desk. You said, Intira, take a look at this. It's not diverse enough. There are not enough people of color representing this borough and this city. And then you raced out in true Karen style. <laughs> um, so let's start there. What is the responsibility, Karen, of institutional leaders in the diversity and inclusion space? Well, first of all, let me just say how inspiring and, and amazing your story is and how you told it so theatrically and in such a moving way. And having known you all these years, I learned so much more about you just in these last few minutes while you've been talking. And that kind of, um, your story is the story that we want to amplify and share because every young person that has an opportunity to experience the arts, to experience uh, creative self-expression, has a better life, a richer life. And I don't, I, I'm not even talking about what neighborhood you come from, who you are, 
uh, what your background is, the arts should be part of everyone's life because of what it delivers, including inspiring love of learning, discovery of new and different cultures, building communities. All of these things happen within our sector, which is so often under respected and treated as a as some kind of elite uh, learning form rather than one that is accessible to everyone. And your story illustrates the accessibility to everyone. So let me just say that I had a big moment of awakening in, uh, I think it may have been when you were at BAM, it may have been a little bit before. Obviously I was there from 1979. We worked on a lot of complicated projects. We were dealing with building an audience. We had very large theaters to fill. We didn't have a lot of money. It was not an easy job. But one night I went to a town meeting and I stood at the back and I listened to some people who were speaking refer to BAM as a plantation. And this to me was devastating. It was a moment of shame. It was a moment of embarrassment. And it was kind of a wake up call. Um, and I decided in that moment that my goal was to change this, to do whatever I could to rethink the way that our institution looked in the eyes of many of its neighbors. And so to that end, fundraiser that I am and that I was, I went to the Rockefeller Foundation and persuaded Darren Walker, who was then there, uh, to make a grant to BAM where we could do focus groups, um, research, um, um, surveys, and a variety of other interventions so that we could develop a path forward that would correct this problem. And, and I'm not saying that we have fixed it completely, but I believe that the changes we made were fundamental in setting a different course for the institution. The end result of the process was multidimensional. We built the Fisher Building, and that was a massive undertaking, an extremely expensive and complicated venture that took 10 years, but we got it done. And partly the reason for doing that was so that we could have a space that was more affordable, more accessible, more community friendly. We developed different rental strategies. Um, there was a for-profit, not-for-profit, and Brooklyn not-for-profit, so that we could really bring the price way down when we were talking about use by our, by our uh, colleagues in our neighborhood. But separately from building the building, which was clearly uh, an enormous and complicated project, we looked at the institution in terms of diversity, top down, bottom up. And that meant bringing in more uh, people of color onto the board, onto executive leadership, at director position and uh, up and down every component of the institution's uh, personnel. And then beyond that, we looked at programs. And that is where the story that you told comes to bear, that it wasn't just about having more diversity in the education programs. It was about having more diversity in the education programs, on the main stage, in the film area, and in every aspect of the institution's life. And I believe that we made great strides. Uh, audience outreach was another component of this strategy, but I felt like what we needed to do was to look at it and make change in every aspect of our work. And in doing so, we would be a better institution in every way, artistically, as a neighbor, as a business, as a international presenter in everything we did. And it wasn't just because diversity was the right thing to do, which obviously it was, it's because of course it was the most interesting thing to do. We became a far more interesting institution and one that many different kinds of people wanted to engage with because there were different points of entry for them to get involved. So that was a kind of a long answer, but I feel like you opened the door with a great question.
Well, no, I love that. And I will say that it's, it's interesting to watch BAM's um, evolution since my tenure to me being an audience member and living in Brooklyn and coming to BAM to see so much um, as an audience member and watching more and more people who look like me in the audience, more and more of the curation on screen where I, I literally will stop something happening during a weekend because BAM is the only one playing something that no one else is taking a chance on. Um, that is, is my, you know, my social space representation that that's the only place I can go to see it. So Karen, just so those who are on the, on this with us and they're leading and they're, you know, finding their way through this pandemic fog, um, what is a, what was a program that as a model, it just rang true. It just did what it needed to do in terms of representing the community it served. We know that Central Brooklyn, as of the 2010 census, we know the new census came out and there was so many underrepresentation of numbers, but Central Brooklyn is home to the largest African-American community in the nation. And what program just got it right and what was the learning from that program that BAM put forward? Well, I think that there were a number of programs, um, some were in the education area, some were on the main stage. One of the things that we tried to do is that we wanted to address important issues that were um, connected to people in our community, in the larger community, and then um, issues that were uh, being talked about in the country. So. Uh, Muslim Voices, Arts and Ideas was a very powerful festival that we put together. It was a citywide festival. We joined forces with seven or eight other cultural institutions around the city and uh, ranging from the Metropolitan Museum to Mokata right around the corner from us. Um, there was music, there was a conference that we put together with NYU. There were a variety of different performances. We had performers come from all over the world. Everything about this festival was complicated. The visas were practically impossible. The partners were complicated. The, fun, the fundraising really surprised me because I thought that we were addressing um, an issue of uh, looking at artists from, you know, 10 to 15 different Muslim countries and bringing their work to the United States and talking about it uh, for the first time, really. So I thought funders were just gonna make it easy for us. And instead, it turned out to be incredibly difficult and that really surprised me. But nevertheless, we soldiered on, we got it done and it was a real game changer. We met so many people that we didn't know. We had community committees, we had consulate committees, um, we had all kinds of leadership committees. So putting this thing together um, was a massive undertaking that involved a lot of people and a lot of organizations. And we knew we weren't gonna save the world, but what we thought we would do was encourage learning, learning more about um, some cultures that, that a lot of people um, didn't know enough about in our neighborhood and in our city. So that was a great one. And I would say that another program of a similar nature uh, was a festival we did called Sea Cuba, which was also, um, you know, dance, music, talks, everything. And we did it in a citywide context. And finally, I would say Dance Africa, of course, which has been going for more than 40 years. Amazing. It, it's okay. a tour de force. You know, I have a whole chapter about it in the book because of what Baba Chuck Davis brought to us uh, through this astonishing Memorial Day, you know, masterpiece. And um, particularly the way that it affected young people and our amazing restoration dance company uh, that performs every year alongside the professional dancers and has done so for 25 years. It's in fact how I met Restoration for the first time. Yeah. So yeah, it was through the work through BAM and that amazing partnership. And while the, the Billie Holiday Theater is celebrating a 50th anniversary this year, they're also celebrating 25 years of that partnership. 
which yeah. is quite and, extraordinary. And you know what? One other thing that we should say about it, it was really amazing. Restoration had been down the street from BAM for you know decades, and we did not know each other. This was another part of that whole diversity issue that we just talked about. Yeah. And I, uh, at one point, called up the Reverend Emma Jordan Simpson, who was running program at Restoration. And I said, I'm coming over and want to meet you and let's talk about what we might do together. I have enormous respect for your institution. And we became great partners and um, working with you and um, many of the other leaders of BAM and at Restoration, it's just, incredible how many kids have come through this program and how meaningful it has been to everyone who has participated. And now, of course, there are scholarships. Um, you know, there are all kinds of things that have come out of it that have um, really benefited young people in our community. No, that's absolutely true. We have students who have gone on to do doctorates and uh, law degrees. And um, it, was, it really was about expanding a worldview um, and, and having them see beyond, uh, you know, the confines of, of one space. It was really quite extraordinary. Um, Laura, we have just a, a minute or two more, and I want to ask you two final questions. You know, we've just gone through this extraordinary consequential moment, and that, that has changed so many of us. It certainly changed our landscape. How has it shifted your point of view, this now, moment? This Indira, moment could you, can you repeat that? Because the screen sure. just froze for a second. Go ahead. Oh, absolutely. How has this moment of pause um, impacted your impacted your point of view, this moment of COVID? Well, you know, obviously it's been really stressful and it has just shattered the field in so many ways with having to stay closed and money and all of these things but I'm gonna take the positive here. Here is the good story about this. I think that so many neighborhoods have experienced kind of shock um, that so much retail has departed. Uh, so many um, institutions were left depleted. A lot of things have happened. And in a funny way, I think we have a moment where our field arts and culture may get more respect. We don't leave neighborhoods, we stay. We have an enduring presence. We uh, create street life and vitality and services for youth and so many positive things that I am hoping that government officials, elected officials and private donors and audience members will see what arts institutions for such, small amount, uh, so, such a small amount of investment, bring to neighborhoods, bring to cities, that they will double down and reconsider supporting our field and getting involved. Yeah. I think this is critical. And also the idea that both COVID and Black Lives Matter kind of happening at the same time, I mean, it's so intense. And that too, I think has brought about greater investment and support for many BIPOC institutions. So now I think we're going to see even more vitality, um, more programs, more excitement in all five boroughs as a true five borough cultural city. And um, I'm excited about what the future has in store for us, even though I don't think it will ever be an easy path. Yeah. I think that's right. Karen, thank you so much. I'm always honored to have time with you. Thank you for thank being you. an ally in my personal journey and professional journey. And um, it's always wonderful to share space with you. I'm honored to be here with you, Indira. And uh, I thank you all for including me in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. You know, at a time when many radio stations, as we talk about stories and stories that matter, at a time when many radio stations were experimenting with internet-based media, it may have seemed unusual for a station to take on producing content for listeners to hear it here, here within its own walls of bricks and mortar. I spent from 2006 to 2013 focused on what a live event space could mean to a radio station in New York City 
in the 21st century, New York City and beyond, really. How to honor the past of this great 20th century invention while inviting in new voices and new points of view. The Jerome L. Green Performance Space, AKA the Green Space. My vision for this space was that it could be a portal, an entryway to other platforms, inviting in new audiences that New York Public Radio had not historically been as deeply connected to as they desired. More ethnically diverse audiences, younger audiences, but not just with talent, but with diversity and belonging for those who led and hosted conversations. That audiences could experience great moments of storytelling in person, on air and online, all at the same time. In those live events, we witnessed moments that could not have occurred in a traditional radio format. There was a live radio broadcast and a live video webcast of the Brian Lair Show on February 11th, 2011, during the Tahir Square demonstrations in Cairo, Egypt. The Green Space convened a diverse studio audience of New Yorkers who had experienced revolution during their lifetimes, mainly comprised of Egyptian Americans. No one could have guessed that former President Mubarak would step down during that live broadcast, creating an emotional, unforgettable emotional stir in the green space. Mona El Tahawi, Egyptian journalist and activist, shared through tears, this is the best day of so many of our lives. A day, a moment that was captured live in person, live online and live on air. And another powerful moment, a tear fell on the cheek of an audience member, November 20th, as she listened to the Moonlight Sonata, performed as part of WQXR's marathon presentation of all of Beethoven's piano sonatas, a once in a lifetime experience for many who stayed with us for all 12 hours, once again, live on air, live online and live in person. The Green Space's Zora Neale Hurston project or the recording for the first time ever of all of August Wilson's American Century Cycle works offered live events as well as on air and online content a decade before we push cultural content during COVID. Experimentation was the central tenet of our events. We saw the green space less as a fixed space than as a process for surprising discoveries and spontaneous learning. New York Public Radio's former president and CEO, Laura Walker, was always a champion of experimentation. Laura Walker took office as the 11th president of Bennington College on August 1, 2020. Prior to this appointment, she was a president and CEO of New York Public Radio, a position that she held for 23 years. Ms. Walker is a visionary, mission-oriented, and strategic leader who spearheaded the transformation of New York Public Radio from two city-owned local stations to the nation's largest independent nonprofit public radio station group and a groundbreaking producer that serves more than 26 million people each month. Her fearless journalism that represents the breadth of American experience helped establish the station's role as one of the world's preeminent podcast producers. During her tenure, NYPR was awarded 10 Peabody Awards and many other honors. With regular re-examinations of the media landscape, New York Public Radio was able to consistently adapt to sh shifting trends and stay ahead of challenges on the horizon. Following her tenure at NYPR, she was an executive fellow in residence at the Yale School of Management and an advisor to media startups and nonprofits. She sits on the boards of the Commonwealth Fund, the Eagle Pitcher Trust, Yale University's Honorary Degree Committee, and the President's Advisory Council of Wesleyan College. In 2009 and again in 2017, Ms. Walker was named by Cranes as one of New York City's 50 most powerful women. Please join me in welcoming Laura Walker. Thank you so much, Indira. It is indeed a huge honor and privilege to be here with you and so fabulous to hear um, your story. It is, does not surprise me that you were the fastest runner in the class by <laughs> any means. <laughs> You're still running so fast and ahead of us all. 
<laughs> oh no no it's so good to see you laura the last time we sat together it was pre-covid we could enjoy a glass of wine without a mask and but here we are and so much has changed in the world mm -hmm. so much um you know the exercise laura of organizing my thoughts around today's talk i realize how many powerful and just smart and soulful women i've had the opportunity to work with so i want to ask you a question i asked karen which is we had these converging pandemics of COVID-19 and the protests that rang out across the world in response to the murder of George Floyd. How did that impact you, not only personally, um, but shift your point of view as a leader? You know, I had left uh, New York Public Radio by the time, uh, you know, uh, George Floyd was murdered and, um, and COVID started. I started at Bennington in August of 2020, as you said, um, right after uh, the, the beginning of COVID, I think we all thought it was going to stop uh, soon and go into a regular academic year. It was my first time as a, and it is my first time as a college president. So um, for me, it was a time, I loved what you said. It was a pause, a pause that made at the best, at, at its best, made us all reflect uh, about how we as leaders um, as you know, humans can lead a more purposeful life individually, but also for our institutions to examine more deeply um, what does it mean to be anti-racist? What does it mean to bring people together? Who should we be uh, inviting into the room and, uh, and uh, as leaders and, and highlighting and how I think as a leader, one, can have some humility and always learn and and kind of question one's own actions and about you know uh, how we lead and how we uh, and what we what conversations we choose to have how we can look at the systems within our own organizations um, that uh, that that are in, in fact racist and sexist and how do we as leaders change them? Yeah, I, I read about the working group that you created and spearheaded on anti-racism at Biddington College. Um, I thought uh, it was quite a profound way to leverage the voices of students and faculty and board and community members. Um, how is that going and any unexpected learnings that have come out of that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is really interesting. I didn't know actually that in academia, you most, it, it's very rare to bring together all of those communities. So it was a little bit out of, uh, you know, naivete, if you will. Um, but bring, it was fascinating. It was so fascinating to hear alums and board members and students. And I think one of the great learnings was that the students and particularly the BIPOC students, um, they were leaders, such leaders in this uh, work and in this uh, conversation introducing us along with some of the faculty to Bell Hooks and her wonderful work uh, about, you know, teaching and trans, uh, teaching to transgress. And uh, I think also I was, um, you know, it, it, it helped me learn the institution, both where the challenges were and where the people were that were going to uh, make change, you know, so, uh, we're making progress. Um, we're opening up a whole center. Uh, Ramadan right now, we're, uh, you know, responding and, and having a, a space for people to set to, you know, to pray and to break fast every day. Um, we are doing readings of bell hooks and using art uh, as a way to um, look deeply. And then we're, we're, um, and, and have conversation as a community. Um, but there's more to do. There's more to do. And we are tr making progress against some very specific metrics. Yeah, as, as, a, as a Black woman and as a woman who has focused on these conversations most of my life, I am, I am, da it's daunting how much work we have ahead of us. Right. It's daunting. Um, and 
you know, I find myself going through a very similar process that you're going through, which is turning over almost every stone in my heart and in my mind and seeing things that I didn't realize could lead to something that someone else does not feel as welcomed in a space or that they belong in a space. And how can I, you know, how can I be as an institutional leader, an example of that? And so it is really roll up the sleeves and get in there and let's do the work kind of work. Um, yeah, I, I think that's right. I'm, I'm curious also, Laura, as a woman leader, you are navigating and negotiating through another whole subset of systemic inequities as a woman, gender-based systemic inequities. Um, and we know that there are a lot of women in the nonprofit world and they're a lot more evolving um, towards greater leadership. What learnings would you give to these leaders um, as they navigate and negotiate these, um, the gender-based systemic inequities? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think one of the pieces of advice I would give is as a leader, um, mentor other young women for them, but also really for yourself. Uh, for me, being in touch with and um, uh, you know helping other women is more of a help to me. And you know, I'm struck. Uh, just this morning, I got um, two emails actually from students. Um, uh, women students, one of them inviting me into a training uh, about restorative justice circles and how we, uh, something that is being used at, at Bennington to uh, deal with some complex issues within dorms and with, with sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, and the other one was, um, I had been walking uh, the other day on campus and started a conversation with a young student um, who is starting a reading group uh, around Sexual Citizens, which is a book about sexual harassment on, the, on college campuses. And she invited me into the book group. Um, she had inspired me to start reading it. Uh, but I think for me, um, that's one of the best ways to lead because you have to listen deeply. and. That's something, Indira, that you have taught me um, to, to, in our relationship, to really, uh, you give me more than I give you all the time. And I, honestly, the way to lead in general for me, it's to create with others a vision and then to find the incredible talent and, and support them and, um, and to be a talent magnet. That's what uh, you know, we tried to do at New York Public Radio. You were exactly, um, you were such a magnet yourself. And you, you talk about how uh, in the green space, it did things um, you know, that, that radio couldn't do. But one of the things that I think is really powerful about the green space was that it was a separate, space that could be a leader and from the beginning could have, uh, it was, you know, it, it wasn't bound by all this, you know, basically, frankly, a radio lineup of white men, one after another, after another, we could, and you could create it from the beginning with the audience, with the, well, with the, the people on, uh, you know, that, that you were inviting in that, and then gradually the audience started changing. I was actually looking at the, um, the opening of the green space on YouTube today, boy, we all looked so young um, in 2009. <laughs> and, you know, you had put together this incredibly celebratory, beautiful, diverse kind of program. I think um, uh, uh, it was uh, the drummers, right? And um, uh, all the drummers from different was very awesome. um, uh Charlie Parker, and it was the Songs of Solomon, you know, uh, singing. It was an amazing program. And the audience was Lily White. Well, fast forward to the Century Cycle and, and this amazing, amazing, um, you know, kind of uh, all 10 of those plays from Joe Turner's Come and Gone to Radio Golf. It was just, and the audience and the stage looked different. And, you know, that's what leadership is about. It's about finding the, the brilliance and the extraordinary people and giving them support and, and room and taking risks. You know, I think it is 
you know, I, I, the, the green space was a place that worked to change the future, you know, while also honoring artists and storytellers. You know, it was a place that, that very, very consciously was taking risks to make new experiences and standing for the truth and believing, believing that transformative moments happen face to face as well as on the radio, but one person at a time. And to take the, what you did, which was to take and remix the voices of New York City, you know, and, and um, put them out there live and then with a window onto the world. Yeah, I um I appreciate. Thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate. I don't know if you remember this moment, Laura. We were sitting in um a room of architects and contractors and it was all men except for the two of us. And I had a list. I'd gone home over the weekend and I made this list. I did my homework. I made this long list and I brought it out and they were all talking pretty loudly, I remember. And I started saying I think, you know, <laughs> and they were still all talking and you said, hold on a second. I need, I need everyone to listen. She's actually got a list of things we need to pay attention to. And they all got very quiet and they were all looking and I started my list. And I remember after that, you weren't always in those meetings, but still people stopped to listen. So I've learned to do that as a woman leader. I've learned to say for younger female uh, professionals who may not always have the chutzpah yet to take the room, wait a second, so-and-so is saying something. So I had to just recall that memory because it, you know, it's, it's with growing um, authority that we stand and that we, as you said, mentor others and pull them forward. Laura, I'm going to ask one final question, um, and thank you for going down memory lane with me and 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 living in in those times together. I I find the green space to be one of my most cherished um, times on planet Earth. Um, what is your hope, Laura, as you look to the future for the cultural field at large and for institutions that are focused on telling stories that matter? Well, you know, I think of um what Alice Walker said, um, someone who you introduced me to. Um, she said, if art doesn't make us better, then what on earth is it for? And um, that's my dream, that art that we all uh, are witnessing, supporting, um, will make us better. And uh, we need art more now more than ever. And so, my dream also is that we deeply, deeply appreciate the art and the history of, you know, of, of all people and that we see the brilliance and the insight and that we are able to use art and performance as a way to ground ourselves like we did earlier as we did that meditation to poetry to also you know, uh, to, to think um, that you were born in a time of fire, that that is inspirational um, and that we can create some dreams um, and get through yeah. the ambiguity and the hostility and the, you know, the, the divisiveness to find some love and find some, you know, collaboration uh, and make a better world. And make a better world, indeed. Laura, thank you so much for joining us, me, this afternoon. So honored and can't wait till we can connect in person um, next Likewise. time. Likewise. Uh, so and much. I just want to say one last thing, because this won't come out, I'm sure, as you are, you know, giving your, your, um, your professional life. Um, one thing about Indira is that she is such a wonderful mom. And, you know, that I know means so much to you. And it's meant so much to me to share that with you. And, you know, you brought your daughter many times to the green space and that also lit up the space. So I just want to say that to you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Maybe my favorite moment of the afternoon. Thank you, Laura. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. So, much. you. Oh, so um, 
Thank you, thank you everyone for hanging in there. As I as I think forward, you know, I think about what it means for those leaders who are leading um, African, Latinx, Asian, Arab, and Native American focused arts and cultural institutions. And studies have emerged that paint a very vivid picture that we've been living. Um, the realities of leading an institution that primarily serves communities of color to financial sustainability is a bleak enterprise given the current funding realities for those institutions. A Helicon collaborative study, not just money, analyzed funding trends across the country and found that out of 41,000 cultural groups, just 2% received 58% of all contributed income. 2% received 58%. Those that focus on Western European arts and serve upper income, predominantly white audiences, fare much better. Many institutions across the nation hold the very history of communities and cultures that have been disenfranchised, and that is why we must protect against disinvestment. Having spent time working in mainstream, predominantly white-led nonprofit institutions, leading major initiatives or departments before leading an institution of color, I have a foot in each world regarding my experiences and perspective with regards to sustainability. There are many institutions led by and for historically marginalized people, including the Billie Holiday Theater that I had the privilege of serving as the executive artistic director. They understand the tenuous place that we, that we found ourselves. Institutions that have been creating great art for decades and were forged in cultural moments of revolution and resistance and a nation that has not always upheld its promise of liberty and justice for all. Despite their arts role as a contributor to thriving neighborhoods, there has been historical and inadequate investment in low to moderate income communities. 87% of African-American theaters, for example, founded in the 1960s and beyond, 87% had to close their doors in the mid 1990s. If we were to frame these realities using, let's say, Bed-Stuy, a community I worked in for seven years, within the conversation of reparations, which is now a national conversation, it might look something like this. In 2015, a study was done by the Brooklyn Community Foundation. New York City and state arts funding was at a median of $6.25 per resident. That's $6.25 median funding for city and state. For Bed-Stuy, it was $2.44. That's a difference of $3.82 in investment. If you were to multiply that $3.82, and these are just rough math statistics, it does not take into account inflation, it does not take into account exact um, demographic numbers, but just roughly, if you were to multiply the $3.82 times 50 years, times 154,000 residents, you're looking at $30 million of disinvestments that other parts of the city and state and cultural institutions received. That's close to $30 million that one institution, one, one community rather, one community did not receive that other parts of the city and the state did. So what does the journey towards true arts equity look like? If nothing else, this new journey requires, in the words of Toni Morrison, seeing in the new pattern of an old idea, the revelation and the word. It requires a revelatory ecosystem that places our communities at the very center and demands of us, the arts and culture field, an answer to the question, not what do we need to thrive, but what do our communities need in order to thrive? As institutions of color look to build and reimagine business models of sustainability that move us into the future, we know that those institutions cannot survive, let alone thrive, without a full ecosystem of deeply engaged donors, private funders, government funding, board members, artists, partnering cultural institutions and organizations like Karen spoke about earlier, 
and community members profoundly and intentionally committed to that survival and that thriveability. I believe that we can ensure the fundamental right to art for all people, especially the most vulnerable people in our society. The absence of art and thriving cultural institutions to stand on the front lines with all people and communities is not just a side effect of poverty. It is an integral part of what it means to be poor. I want to end with answering two questions that I posed to both Karen and Laura about the converging pandemics and how it changed how I saw the world. This moment in history, perhaps the most con consequential in modern history, it deepened my belief and my resolve in the power of the arts and the power of artists. The Billie Holiday Theater created space on Fulton Street for New York State's first street-sized Black Lives Matter mural. Particularly poignant, poignant is the detail of 20 large rectangles representing the year 2020 and a row of caskets with the names of victim, victims of police brutality and racially motivated violence in this country. From Emmett Teal to Martin Luther King to Eric Hawkins to Trayvon Martin to Breonna Taylor to George Floyd to the killings of two black trans women, Rhea Milton and Dominique Phelps. The community re-sanctified the ground of the Lenape tribe who originally occupied that space. The community consecrated it with the creative expression of song and dance, prayers, tears, vigils, flowers, sage chanting and gathering. Over and over again, it became the sacred ground of storytelling. And so hundreds of artists and community members came together even as we needed to stand six feet apart and we wielded the sword of creative expression, a sword that guards against those who would attempt to oppress any democratic ideal. And the words began to appear made up of 16 letters, Black Lives Matter, over 150 gallons of paint, traffic paint, hundreds of paintbrushes and rollers, over a thousand collective hours of bent knees on the asphalt of bed the unforgiving hot asphalt of summer in New York City. The names came to us in our search for remembering and through community members who could not forget. The list grew and grew until we had over 160 names, names that were a drop in the bucket of blood that has been shed on American soil in the name of racial injustice and violence against black children, women, and men our fellow Americans. This mural remains one of the most powerful artistic projects that I've ever produced because it was truly of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it was forged in a radical love for a people, a community, a justice. I was born to a time of fire. And I, like my parents, I believe in radical love. Martin Luther King Jr. shared, power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power creating everything that stands against love. The love that pulsates in our very DNA, a love for justice, for humanity, for freedom. Our stories and narratives are fundamental love stories of freedom to this planet with the hopes that we find our wisest, most exquisite, and beautiful selves as a human race. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Indira at Waru. Please show her some love in the chat. I know I am carrying with me what you just said. What do we need to thrive? But what do the communities we serve need to thrive? Um, and we're just so grateful for your time, your wisdom, your stories, your candor, um, and for being with us today as we kick off Face to Face 2022. Also, a special thank you to all of our other guests who joined us today, Mahogany Brown, Karen Brooks Hopkins, and Laura Walker, as well as to our conference co-chair, Dr. Darrell Cooper, who helped us kick things off earlier today. 
A special thank you as well to the roundtable staff who are on the call, our programming manager, Kinsey Keck, our communications manager, Alex Latore, as well as our mentorship coordinator, Monisha Bayana. And a special thank you to all of our audience who tuned in on this beautiful Monday morning to help us celebrate um, uh, our next chapter here at the roundtable. Uh, and so with that, we hope to see you at our future face-to-face -face events. As was said earlier today, we're going to be face-to-face -to -face tomorrow in person at face-to-face -face at the Queen's Museum. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to register, there's just a couple more spots left if you're interested. And then we're going to pick things back up on Thursday, April 14th at 10 a.m. with arts and climate action using our platforms to create change. And that will be happening online via Zoom. Um, with that, we are so grateful to be holding this space with all of you today, and we look forward to seeing you very soon again. Enjoy your evening. Bye, everyone.